Hi, this is John Reed. I'm back at uh, Sapphire Now, uh, but this podcast isn't really about Sapphire Now, but I'm rejoined by Brian Dennett. How's it going? Good. We just taped a 30-minute podcast on Sapphire Now that should be all the review you could ever want, I would hope. Uh, so so now we're going to talk more about what, what's driving your venture and your passion for AI and machine learning. And you're, you're actually a classic enterprise guy. You've got a lot of ERP project background, so you've gone through a lot of transitions in your thinking as well. Indeed. One thing I really wanted to get into is your focus on practical AI from a project standpoint, because I, I recently wrote on Digenomica that, that well, so, so I'll backtrack a bit. Den, Den Hallett wrote a post basically that says AI isn't intelligent, it's dumb. Mm-hmm. And, and his whole point was that the limitations on today's AI technology are, are, are significant and way more than a lot of the hype masters would have us believe. And another point that he wanted to make is that a lot of the terminology around AI is thrown, thrown around way too loosely, which I think we can all agree upon, right? Like, yeah. I do it too. I mention AI when it's not really generally artificially intelligent in any meaningful way. Um, so, so he was making those points, which I think are really valid. And, and in a follow-up piece rounding out some of our coverage, I basically said that what we're trying to do at Genomica is two things, um, kind of puncture hype balloons around the concepts, but then also look at what's possible now, because my experience is that there are some cool things that are possible now once you understand sort of both the limitations and the potential of what today can do. And I know that's something that, since you guys are doing this for, for real, <laughs> you see with your customers all the time. Yeah. So, um, so, so, so with that in mind, what, you, you talked to me uh, before we started recording about practical AI, so how do you define that? So I think that I, I agree with all your criticisms of the current AI hype cycle that we're in. And the way that I like to kind of draw a line here and frame this is that, you know, AI, the, the whole notion of general intelligence of some sort, um, I think a big part of that is decision making. And so mm-hmm. if, you, if you think about we're not quite there, we don't have techniques and models that are mature enough to always get to a point where you can confidently allow a system to autonomously make decisions. Um, if you take a step back from that and you think about what's left, really that's where I think you start to see the opportunity space for AI as we know it right now. And I don't like the term AI when you start thinking about it in those terms. And so what I've gone with is IA. And so intelligence augmentation. We mm-hmm. are still the AI. Humans are still the AI. And, and mm-hmm. so what AI tooling can do is empower the human. And so AI techniques are really good at taking complex data and figuring out good ways to package that in bite-sized digestible chunks and mm-hmm. make humans more effective at making decisions. Mm-hmm. And, and that was really one of the core tenets behind what we were looking for when we decided to start a startup. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you think about that a little bit more, Really what it comes down to is it's not AI, it's machine learning. And for us, it's machine learning is one pillar and the natural language is the mm-hmm. other. And there's a blurring of the lines there, but really those are kind of two different skill sets. Um, and the one that most people are interested in, in is the machine learning. And machine learning, uh, to just elaborate a little bit more in terms of definitions, I do think that there's been a lot of debate, if you're a machine learning practitioner, of what really is machine learning right now because... Statistical modeling has existed forever. Um, a lot of these algorithms have been around for decades or longer. Um, and, and so really what's happening is machine learning, in my opinion, is the umbrella term under which all of these different mathematical techniques from all these different disciplines are being revisited with fresh eyes. Mm-hmm. And I think from that perspective... And fresh computing power, right? Like, yes. like, a, like a much greater ability to digest massive data sets and the availability of massive data sets, those are the key ingredients, right, that, that kind of make these older, <laughs> a lot of these are classic tech approaches, but they kind of give a new bite to them, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's definitely true. I mean, that yeah. really was the thing that kind of triggered this whole hype cycle, right? We have more data, more mm-hmm. test sets, and more compute in order to actually play around with some of these algorithms at scale and right. see what the logical conclusion was to some of these algorithms. Yeah. Um, and so you're, you're absolutely right about that, that that has been a big driving force. Mm-hmm. And, and so now that we, we have that compute at our disposal, there, there really is this opportunity for academia to kind of revisit a lot of old tricks and, and see what you can do with it. Um, and that, that is another thing, another core tenet for us is essentially academia has done all this amazing work for, you know, a decade plus. I mean, arguably it's been like 
you know, since the last AI winter that academia has been hard at work trying to mm-hmm. figure out these ML algorithms and they made a ton of progress and mm-hmm. not a lot of it has gotten commercialized effectively. And I think that that's starting to happen. And mm-hmm. so that's one of the ways we look at this is what has academia kind of honed in on. Mm-hmm. And I think the interesting thing there is trying to bridge that gap between practical application and academia and there's a lot of cases where academia wants to stay absolutely pure. If they can't write a simple mathematical equation, a simple mm-hmm. algorithm that essentially solves that problem, then it doesn't work out as a good paper. Where mm-hmm. in in industry, um, you can cheat all over the place. And if you start thinking about, like, how does this algorithm work and where are the aspects of it where I can cheat a little bit, where I can add a little bias based on my industry mm-hmm. expertise, well, suddenly there's potential wins there. Mm-hmm. And I think you're going to see more and more and more of that mm-hmm. uh, as time goes on. And so I, I guess that is kind of, in a nutshell, my my thinking in terms of uh, the current AI hype cycle and how to kind of step down from that into what I consider practical AI. Right. And I think we missed one more ingredient of what's happening now. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the final piece of the puzzle is the fact that these, uh, the impact of open source. Yes. And the fact that 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 companies like Google have realized that it's all about adoption and ecosystem, and so they need to expose their AI, uh, their machine learning libraries and technology, which makes it possible for startups like yourself to to not have to build all that from scratch necessarily. You can consume some of the stuff you need to consume. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, that's that's totally fair. I mean, yeah. you're you're totally right that I should give a lot more credit to the open source community and to some of these organizations that are really releasing these kinds of toolkits. Um, because it really does speed up uh, the ability to go to market with some of these things. The the things that you can pick up off the shelf and start gluing together are are fantastic and powerful tools. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it really it's it's refreshing to to see how much is out there and available. And the communities and the discussions around these things right. um, are super helpful. There's a lot of people that are, are very open about the work that they're doing and. It's it's nice to see um, a community that's not as afraid to talk about the failures because oftentimes those are the things you learn most from. Bottom line, no excuses not to kick ass, basically. <laughs> yes, um, I, w- I would agree with that. <laughs> uh, so so so, but there's also trends in play in in industry that inspired your company as well. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So um, there, we definitely went through a little bit of a journey of customer discovery to land on what we're doing now at Enable AI. Um, cause if, if, you know, you think about it in terms of like, we, we knew that there were opportunities for commercialization in the ML space, and we knew that there were gaps in the value chain there. And so we talked to companies with that in mind. And one thing that's kept on coming up in conversation was this shift towards these more brand forward organizations with, uh, much more brand sensitivity. They were much more customer centric. Uh, there's so much conversation about the customer experience. And and so at some point, I ended up having a couple conversations where they were very critical of the current suite of products that are available to solve that part of the problem. Um, essentially, a lot of the tools out there are still relatively shallow in terms of the way that they analyze that data mm-hmm. and the way that they allow you to act upon that data. And so that became the problem space that we latched onto was this whole idea of mm. uh, market research of how do you understand the customer voice better? How do you understand how to reach the customer? Who is your customer? Like, who mm. is your potential customer? How is your competitor um, talking to them versus how you are talking to them? How is your conversation mm. different from the com- uh, the customer conversation? Mm-hmm. And there aren't good ways to get those answers right now. And so that is basically what we're doing at this point is building the tooling to allow companies to have the insight into those questions. Mm. Yeah, those are, are really, really tricky questions and, and, and also like how to properly act on that data. Um, it was actually a theme of the conference, too, in terms of the SAP C4 HANA announcement. We're not going to talk about SAP too much, but but basically that, that the customer experience and, and how to create a good customer experience is really, really important, and especially because so much of it is about retaining customers over time. And if I become disillusioned with my experience, I'm going to leave you. And, and so how do you, like, 
properly treat me in various contexts versus other customers who have totally different priorities than me. Right. And it seems like there, sh- this should be a role where <laughs> so-called AI can, can make a difference, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, you see a lot of it already. I mean, there's a lot of competitors in the space. I would, I mean, SAP has acquired some of them. Yeah. And, uh, and I do think that this C4 strategy makes a ton of sense with the, uh, the, the market trends happening in that space. Um, I do think that when you think about where ML is being applied to that space, it is a mm-hmm. lot in terms of like cohort analysis. So mm-hmm. like your click patterns, your open right. rates on emails, your uh, point of sale data. Yeah. And so that's, that's one layer of data and it's powerful. It's effective. I mean, if you're not doing it yet, you definitely should be, mm-hmm. but we're looking at the next set of data. What, what's mm-hmm. the next set of data that you can marry up against that data and start mapping out correlations? And mm-hmm. that's really what we're working on is basically what, how, how do you get that deeper analysis? How do you right. bring in that next data set to enrich that strategy? And, and you've had the chance to work with some customers on this, developing this, like co-innovation and stuff? Or? Yeah, yeah. So we've, so. we've been hard at work, mm-hmm. um, really applying engineering rigor to the way we practice machine learning, um, which I guess is a whole other topic that we could open up on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we've, we've essentially gotten to ourselves to a position where we're now ready to quickly roll out proof of concepts for customers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're talking to some larger organizations. We're, you know, working with uh, mm-hmm. one agency. Um, and so really trying to tap into their industry expertise and understand what their customer base is looking for. And we're actively, you know, co-researching uh, the best way to approach the market mm-hmm. with them. And w- would it start with a use case or would it be more of a goal that we want to have a customer experience kind of machine learning platform where we can build out a bunch of different apps and or is it both or uh well so right now it definitely feels a little servicey um Mm -hmm. and ultimately i think it's kind of funny that the leonardo playbook is in many ways the playbook we're operating under right now Mm -hmm. where the the idea is to build out this templates get the 80 Mm percent way there build Mm -hmm. all the tooling we need in order to rapidly run the experiments Mm -hmm. And, and then it just comes down to what comes out of the experiments and how do we, mm-hmm. as quickly as possible, be able to apply that to the customer environments. And mm-hmm. I, we're, we're just now getting to the point where we can do that effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's a very exciting time to say, like, hey, we, we can build all these different models and we can start stitching these models together. And so now what mm-hmm. is the question you're really after? And if we don't know how to answer it yet, we, we've probably already thought through how to answer it. And so mm-hmm. now it's a matter of give us a little bit of extra time to, to get that, that last little bit of the machinery in place for our data mm. pipeline to to get the answer that you're seeking out. Mm. So uh, yes, yesterday I interviewed a Queensland government, an SAP customer, and they were looking at, they, they wanted to use predictive technologies to better understand taxpayers who were g- going to go into default and, and how to address that. And um, what kinds of questions are, are you getting from your pilot customers around, like, what kinds of things do they want to solve? Sure. Um, I think that, uh, in, in large part, the kinds of questions we're seeing is, what is effective? I think that's one of the overarching questions. Mm-hmm. So um, marketing is kind of a fuzzy space to operate in, right. where, you know, you can have some confidence, you can do research in various, in various ways to try and get answers, but you never get to a point where you have a truly concrete answer. Mm-hmm. And so when you work in a space like that, uh, any feedback you can get on, did that work? Who did it work with? How mm-hmm. effective was it? How far did our dollar go? I mean, those are all like super important questions and they come in a bunch of different shapes, mm-hmm. but ultimately the question is, was that effective? And so a lot of what we're mm-hmm. working on is how do we measure that? How do we uh, build these better attribution mm-hmm. models with these new data sets that we're trying to play with? Mm-hmm. Um, and we're definitely seeing some promising results there. You know, I, and I don't know if you spent much time on this aspect, but I think it illustrates your point pretty well. I spent a lot of time looking at at enterprise buying because because uh, in the B two B context, especially, it's it's become pretty complex. And and one of the reasons for that is that the buyer is is a pretty informed individual. And and when you look at the research around this, they spend a fair amount of time, a lot of times, doing their own research and education around solutions that they're considering. For example, 
Um, and they're, they're in contact with all kinds of individuals, right? They're, they're talking to subject matter experts within their organization. So if they're looking at a solution, for example, they might bring their security expert into play. Um, they, to find out about a solution, they might get a short list from an advisor they trust. Or ultimately, they might go on a peer review site. Um, or they might read an article from someone like me. Or they might be talking to someone like yourself. Um, and what, what marketers struggle with, and this connects to the sales process too, is how to apply weighted attribution to these things. Mm -hmm. So in other words, like which of all these various touch points have the most impact on the, the purchase itself? And even if you ask the buyer, which is very labor intensive, they might not even remember all, like, it's tricky with that stuff, right? Like, like you had a conversation one year at a trade show and you almost kind of forgot that you had it, but that, that was the first person that ever mentioned the solution to you. And so the yep. next time you kind of did remember it and then you went to a webinar and then, and, and you might have forgotten that you were at that webinar, but you were then got an e, an email subscription list. And so to me, that's super fascinating because marketers have to figure out, um, they do have budgets to work with, but where to put that, right? Like where, where's the, the biggest impact, and yep. Yep. and we've come a bit of a ways with attribution from where we started. But it strikes me that that this is a this kind of thing is perfect for what you're talking about. Yeah, am I, am I right? Absolutely. And and what you're talking about in terms of all the different touch points in which that uh, customer consumed information about the mm -hmm. the competitive landscape of products that they were looking at, like that's that's essentially our data sets, right? Is right. is where are these products being talked about? How are they being talked about? Right. And I think one of the interesting things there, if you think about attribution models, is so far we've essentially been focused on the click or on the sale, and right. we're looking at it in terms of the language. And so how is the customer speaking? And depending on how that customer is speaking, you can probably start to gather some signal mm -hmm. about where they learned about it. And mm -hmm. I think when you start thinking about it through that lens, there's a whole bunch of very interesting possibilities about how to rethink about the attribution model. Yeah, it's it's a it's a promising area that, that needs a lot that needs a lot of help and and uh, you know I think you know I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that in terms of like how do you how do you weight different aspects and and a lot of times there's social conversations happening that you don't know about mm -hmm. now granted some of this is behind walls that probably even your your crawlers can't penetrate unfortunately yes <laughs> but 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 some of it's public yeah and and, and you still don't know that it's happening even if yeah. you have your your best trackers on because different things can happen in different forms and stuff. I think you and I have talked about this before, how, yeah, there's a couple of dominant sites, but there's also a lot of other places where people might post a question. You know, they might give Quora a try, for example, and post a question there. And, yep. you know, that's to me where like a machine learning perspective can really help because you can crawl all this stuff and then start looking for different patterns. And Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that's one thing that is ex it's ex extremely exciting um, but it's also very daunting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we've taken the strategy of we will acquire data ourselves mm -hmm. um, when and where necessary to drive projects to completion. Mm -hmm. But ideally, our customer already has the data set that they want to explore and understand. Right. Um, but I do think at some point, we or someone else will have to take the big leap to really rethink how you do data acquisition from like a almost a social listening perspective. I hate to use that term because mm. social listening to me um, has become kind of a stagnant industry with a lot of tools mm. that don't go nearly far enough. Um, but I do think that kind of approach applied to all these disparate data sources that you're talking about uh, really leads to some exciting possibilities. Right. So just in terms of, of for the listeners who are thinking about their own products and and where to begin with this stuff, what are you finding as far as when a customer asks you for some advice on there's questions they want to tackle? Do they have the internal resources in house to pursue this? Like in, in conjunction with what you provide them, like what, what are the building blocks here to actually get something going? Cause people are looking for quick wins, right? They don't sure. want to, that's one thing we know for sure is they don't want to spend a year building up a team to, to get this going. Yeah, you know? ab absolutely. And I do think that that is one of the reasons why you've seen so much more traction on the click and point of sale side of things because mm -hmm. it's more structured data. It's more approachable. When you get into the text, text just gets messy. Natural language processing in general mm -hmm. is, is just kind of a fickle thing. And, 
And so I don't know if there really are a lot of good options for companies to to rapidly ramp up. I think mm-hmm. going out and collecting that data, having that data set in place, mm-hmm. and and thinking about it in terms of you know data cleansing activities and going back to the master data theme, mm-hmm. I think that those things are are paramount. But in terms of actually approaching text as a company, like that's maybe one of the few areas where mm-hmm. I do think that companies might be wise to just wait for a vendor to to come mm-hmm. in and tackle the problem. Um, and so really, I do think companies right now, it, it is savvy to just double down on the more concrete numbers uh, that they mm-hmm. do have a better understanding of that they can collect more effectively. And are you able to help companies with the text piece if they want it and stuff like that? If they're if they want to bring in more of the unstructured, that's part of a role you can play. Yeah, I mean that's that's yeah. essentially what we we focus on, what we specialize mm-hmm. in. If someone wants us to look at structured mm-hmm. data, like something related to pricing, yeah, we're, we're happy to approach it. But we understand that text is the daunting. You want thing. to deal with the hard and messy part of it. Yeah, because yeah, I, I definitely am of the opinion that as this this trend continues of machine learning being brought into businesses. I mean, right now, I think the statistic is less than 1% of all businesses have any kind mm-hmm. of ML under mm-hmm. the hood. Um, and I think that that will change and will change rapidly. And so as that does happen, as uh, companies become more savvy, I don't I don't want to be the vendor that's trying to sell them the thing that they can mm-hmm. already do. And so I'm thinking about the thing that's actually going to be difficult for them once they start to have some of this expertise and that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons we've really latched onto this natural language processing aspect. And before we wrap, um, conscious of the fact that we have a little bit of background noise that our listeners are probably getting a little irritated by, even though it's probably better for them than it is for you and me. Um, before we wrap, um, just in terms of a company's internal capabilities and talent to, to work with a, a firm like yourself, for example, um, I, I get the sense that they don't necessarily need data scientists at this point, but it would probably be helpful if they had some savvy sort of data administrator types who are good at surfacing data sets yes. and, 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 and allowing you to crunch them. Is that kind of how a good way to describe what they should have? Or Yeah, I would agree. I think the first step to becoming a ML savvy organization is data engineering. And you mm-hmm. can argue that data science and data engineering really do get kind of lumped together, but the data engineering aspect of it is the most important thing right now for companies. You need to think about how do I make sure that my data is clean, and accessible, um, and if if that is the one thing that you focus on, you can still feel like you're checking the box of becoming an ML savvy organization because that will become the foundation of all future ML strategies. Right. Okay. Well, I think the hallway noise is getting the best of me. I think we're getting a clear message. We need to stop. Uh, any final words? Um, no, I think that uh, for for any company that's you know really interested in this idea of more sophisticated market research, I'd, I'd love to hear from them. I'm always happy okay. to have conversations and trade notes and understand what they're thinking about. And then in the broader ML aspect, I mean, I think that the conversation mm-hmm. that Diginomica is having uh, mm-hmm. is is very on, on point in terms of the way that everyone needs to be thinking about this hype cycle that we're in right now. Agreed. All right. So, folks, reach out to us. Let's talk. Let's continue the conversation. Thanks for sharing that, Brian. Thanks, Appreciate John. it.